really welcome then as we begin this conversation today trying to reimagine higher education in Africa. And this symposium is really one of the events out of a series of events that are beginning to celebrate the centenary of the birth of Nelson Mandela. And so we've partnered with Oxford University Press for this event because of course we know that uh, Oxford University Press are equally dedicated to education as well as youth development. And so this event is about really coming together and paying homage to Mr. Mandela's commitment to education and leadership development. As you are aware, the Mandela Rhodes Foundation and Oxford University Press play a crucial role in higher education on the continent. For the foundation, this takes the shape of providing scholarships and leadership development opportunities to some of Africa's most exceptionally bright, talented, and passionate young leaders who we know will not falter in their commitment regardless of the intractable challenges that we have on the continent. For Oxford University Press, of course, their commitment to education comes in the form of education publishing, and Oxford is situated both in Southern Africa as well as East Africa. And for them, they're really driven by the recognition of the power of education to uplift and really equip individuals towards better lives. And I'm sure, as all of you know, there are some well-known quotes about what Mr. Mandela has said around education, but in my research and preparing for this section, I thought I'd try and find uh, something quite intimate that he, he spoke to, which in essence speaks to the idea of, of, of what we want to unpack today about young people, about the power of education to really help us think through the challenges. And so, in a letter to his son, Makato Mandela, uh, on Robben Island on the 28th of July, 1969. Mandela noted that the issues that agitate uh, humanity today, today call for trained minds. And the people that are deficient in this respect are crippled because they are not in the possession of the tools and equipment necessary to ensure success and victory in service of country as well as our people. And I think this statement from Madiba is obviously very fitting in our current context. And as we obviously think about education and its role and how it's been proposed to be a crucial contributor in training the young minds that will provide innovative solutions for the continents, I guess, and the broader society's challenges. And I guess equally part of what I want to challenge us today as we gather is, you know, we mustn't shy away from challenging this very assumption about whether or not higher education is perhaps not over ambitious in its assumptions uh, that it may be the one that can provide the solutions, especially given the multiple modes of education that are, that are available on the continent and the fact that, of course, only a select few are able um, to go to higher education. And so I think part of the question that we must pose is, you know, uh, people that are educated in ivory towers, can they really uh, provide us with the tools to solve some of the challenges. And so obviously panelists have been briefed to try and give us a bit of a complicated view and hopefully um, uh, hope that in our discussions and engagements we're able to really think through what then we need to do in reimagining higher education as a tool to help us solve the problems. And so process-wise, we're going to have three panels uh, this, this afternoon. The first one will unpack indigenous knowledge in Africa and will be moderated by Atambile Masola. Atambile works in the education faculty at the University of Pretoria. Um, she's also currently doing a PhD and is very interested in black woman life writing. Atambile is a, a thought leader, and I'm sure many of you have come across her writings in Sunday Independent, Men and Guardian, uh, Al Jazeera, Huffington Post, just to name a few. And uh, Atambile is particularly interested right now around the question of literacy, and she's a member of a special interest group called Literacy in Our Lifetime. And of course, she's one of our own, a Mandela Road Scholar 2010. So I think we know we're the panel. And then the second panel will then start to ask the question around representation in higher education, and that will be moderated by Sebenzile Nkambule, who will uh, come up. Sebenzile is a media practitioner by trade, studied journalism, and then went off and did a, a master's in gender studies. And she's currently working in education publishing for Oxford University Press. Uh, Sebenzile has worked, and I'm sure some of you who, who live in the North would have heard her 
um, give some really intriguing commentary on Power FM, Challenging Minds and Hearts. And uh, she also writes and speaks around the transformation imperative. And so really a good person to dig a bit deeper on this question around representation in higher education. And of course, Simon Zine is also one of our own. She's a Mandela Road Scholar 2016. Yeah. And then lastly, the third panel will look at this idea of the African University of the future. And so what does this mean in the context of you know, these new ways of thinking? You know, we have universities as a structure, and um, I've been um, coerced into moderating that, so I'll be facilitating that with our three panelists. So we really hope that you all enjoy today. We obviously want audience participation. The way we've structured it is that we want it to be very much a conversation. And I know that uh, many of you are social media savvy. And so please, we've, we've just launched a, a new Twitter account. It's called MRF underscore Africa. So please follow us. Take out those phones right now. Press follow. And uh, for the event for the whole weekend, hashtag Mandela 100. And it's the number 100. And then hashtag MRF Africa. So please do share on all our social media platforms. Let's get the conversation out. Tweet while we're here. And then without further ado, I'd like to hand over and officially launch our symposium. Atamile, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Judy, for those opening remarks. And we're really excited. I mean, I'm excited. I'm a bit daughter that it's the first panel. So, yeah, I hope we're, we're going to have a good conversation. So I'm just going to start off by introducing um, the people we're going to be in conversation with, and they're really amazing people. Um, so I'll start with um, Diana Ferris. She is a writer, a poet, a, perf a performance poet, a storyteller, and her work in both Afrikaans and English has been published in various collections and some serve as prescribed texts for high school learners. She has her own publishing house, Diana Ferris Publishers, and it has published various publications, including her first Afrikaans collection of poetry, On Skom Fandan. She's also edited and published a collection of stories about fathers and daughters, which uh, is called Slanford May, A Muscled Father, in, which was published in 2006. She's also a founder member of, oh, I hope I get this right, ASV, Afrikaans Schrever for Yenachem. I like that. Okay. Um, and an organization called Bush Poets, which is all women poets. And um, it's, it, there's another one called Women in Exchange, Grassroots Women Writers. Um, I think mo many of us have come across her work on. Um, was her, her work with around the Sarah Bachman uh, moment, and historical moment, I think it was for all of us. Um, and she wrote a poem about that. Um, and well, in this sense, she writes about it. And she's a claim for the poem that she wrote for the indigenous South African woman, Sarah Bachman, who was taken away from her country on, under false pretenses and paraded in Europe. And it was really kind of brought us into consciousness about what that meant for her body to be brought back home again, which is a beautiful, beautiful poem. And she is joined on the panel by Professor Sabelo Ndrofi who is my neighbor in Pretoria. They are up high on the hill in the big imposing building. Uh, he's a professor and the founding head of the Achima Peje Research Institute for Applied Social Policy and and is the executive director of Change Management Unit in the Vice Chancellor's Office at UNISA. He's also the founder of the Africa Decolonial Research Network, which is a DERN, based at UNISA. He's a National Research uh, Foundation NRF-rated social scientist, a member of the Academy of Science of South Africa, a fellow of African Studies Center in the Netherlands, and a research associate at the Ferguson Center for African and Asian Studies at the Open University in the United Kingdom. And he's written many, many, many uh, publications around issues of decoloniality, empire, and his most recent publication, Epistemic Freedom in Africa, Deprovincialization and Decolonization, which was published in July last month. No, we're still in July. Yeah. We're still in July. Yeah, so it's more recent. So welcome and thank you. Um, so they're just going to do the first opening remarks. We probably have a, a few more questions, but as Judy said, we're going to quickly hand over to you and get in conversation about what they present to us. So it's going to be about five minutes. Yeah. 
Thank you, Chair, for the for the generous introduction. Uh, the the subject which we are supposed to discuss is not a, an easy one. It is easy to talk about it, but when you need to reflect critically about it, uh, I actually antagonize in terms of where do I start? And I think there is no way you can begin to talk about indigenous knowledge unless you start with the, the colonial encounter. And I think without that in colonial encounter, we will just be talking about knowledge in Africa rather than indigenous knowledge. And I'm raising that because that encounter becomes the edge of the invasion of the mental universe of Africa. And that, in that process, the, the existing knowledges then they undergo a suppression, displacement, and a marginalization. And then a foreign knowledge begins to come into the center of the continent and begin to actually sit in the minds of, of all of us. That is, that is one, because I, I, I want to, to use the five minutes to try and frame the, the, the issues around the issue of uh, indigenous knowledges. The second issue which I think, second concept which I think will help us in, uh, in understanding the whole debate on indigenous knowledge is the one which, for lack of a better word, will speak about it in terms of cognitive justice. And I will try to, to, to explain that one in as simple as possible. It simply underscores the fact that all human beings are born into valid and legitimate knowledge. And it also means that we need to recognize the diverse ways of knowing by which people across the world provide meaning to their existence and they make sense of the world. And I think if we understand that concept, then we'll begin to appreciate why we speak about indigenous knowledge now. The third concept, which I think would be useful to frame the, 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 the discussion on, uh, on the indigenous knowledge, is the contingency of knowledge. And here I'm trying to argue that knowledge and the truth claims make sense within specific historical settings, within specific cultures, and within specific moral orders. And then the, the fourth is the one which then almost directly addresses the theme which we're talking about. I'm not sure whether I must say indigeneity of knowledge or endogeneity of knowledge. But by that concept, I want to talk about all knowledges are somehow indigenous until they assume imperial, hegemonic, and the universalist tendencies, which entail aggressively displacing and violently erasing other knowledges. Then the, the, the fifth concept, which I think will be important for us in order to understand deeply this issue of indigenous knowledge, is the one which is actually the subject of my current book, Epistemic Freedom. That is struggle for intellectual sovereignty in production and reproduction of knowledge, which includes the right of us as black people to think, to write, to theorize, to communicate and interpret the world from where we are located. And the final one, which I want to reflect on, is then if we accept what I put forward, then it will mean we might actually be able to talk about ecologies of knowledges, the use of diverse knowledges in the academy and in overcoming the challenges of framing, uh, of, of actually overcoming the challenges facing humanity. And I'm giving all this framing in order for, for you to understand that the word indigenous itself might actually be a very problematic one, in the sense that the word actually emerges within a context of modernist colonial imperial paradigm of difference. It actually becomes part and parcel of the politics of othering. And if you like, it becomes actually part and parcel of colonization of time, whereby you then divide human species into those who are primitive, uh, those who are pre-modern, and those who are modern, those who are actually who can claim the present and the future, and those who are actually stuck in the past. And this then means that when we talk about indigenous knowledges today, it is one of those concepts which used to be very negative when it was constructed. 
but which can then be turned around and used for subversive purposes. Uh, and they, you begin then to say, where, when did it begin to be, to be used? Then you can actually go as far back as to the unfolding of modernity itself, uh, particularly modernities. The two concepts in modernity is a, is, a, is a rapture and a difference. That's one. Two, you begin also to find the word being used in relation to the anti-colonial nationalist Africanization drive. Because there was a feeling that the knowledge of, of the indigenous people, of those people who were actually found in Africa, tended to be marginalized, displaced, and pushed to the margins of society. And the issue of, is when we then achieve political independence, what do we do? And then the idea was that we then need to restore what was, we need to pick the pieces and they, in a way restore what was actually dismembered. And in that way, we, we begin to drive the, the concept which Nguk uh, Wathiongo uh, speaks about it as remembering Africa. And then it means that you need to remember using, a, picking the pieces of the, your own knowledges. Then you can also trace it to the resurgence and the insurgence of indigenous peoples across the world who then we found themselves really using other people's knowledges and then they began to speak about the importance of their own knowledges. Then in terms of definitions, which are now, uh, it's, it's very hard to come up with a, a singular definition of what is uh, indigenous knowledge. Will it be possible for us to talk about native knowledges that are not an imposition from outside? Knowledges which are actually contained in, uh, in orature uh, these knowledges which are actually living but they are subjugated, displaced and repressed, these knowledges which are actually carried by communities, and uh, today some people begin to speak about these knowledges in terms of theory from the South. That is rear-gut theorizing as opposed to ven theorizing. And some begin to talk about it in terms of epistemologies of the South, knowledge is born in struggle as people resist injustices, oppressions, imposed by racism, capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. I will leave it here. Thanks, brother. Thanks so much for that. I feel like I'm in class. I've already made so many notes. This is very useful for me. And as my mother would say, so I think we've got a lot of meat to unpack in what you've said. Thanks for those opening remarks. Uh, not the theorist, I'm the poet. <laughs> Whenever the term indigenous knowledge systems comes up, the word loss immediately springs to mind. For me to talk about indigenous knowledge systems requires that I talk about myself, about who I am and my ancestors' relation to indigenous knowledge systems. I was born in Worcester in 1953 five years after the National Party came to power. What I remember is that during my formal school education, I was told little about my ancestors, and what was told was told in a negative way. There was a silence around who we were, even in our own communities. Little was told about the Khoi grandmother or father, or even a slave granny or great granny. Although one managed to pass through life successfully, the absence of knowledge left a void. During the struggle years, we concentrated on obtaining freedom from oppression, and little was articulated about our far colonial past. It was when I attended university, and especially after our first democratic election, that knowledge about indigenous people became freely available. It was the time I truly found myself. I learned much about how they existed, how they were attached to the land, that they had cattle, that they lived in harmony with the earth, that they did not dig and plant, but ate what the earth offered them, that they respected the land, did not overutilize it, they trekked from place to place, exactly knowing where they will get green grass and water for the cattle, how they used the skins of the animals for clothing, the fat for their skins, how they knew which plants were edible, which ones were poisonous, and which ones could heal. I learned that they had a spiritual life, that they respected the elements, 
prayed and danced for rain, that the full moon played a part in their spiritual life, that they had a coming of age ritual for girls who started menstruating, that they had a vibrant storytelling culture, that they lived side by side with the animals, imitated them in their dances, and I could go on forever. Suddenly, I also became aware of certain rituals, uses, that were remnants of indigenous knowledge systems. My mother told me that I was a colic baby, that I cried nonstop, and that she and my father had to sleep in shifts to look after me. And one of the aunties of the neighborhood, Auntie Bess, came with a certain type of grass she picked in the felt. She crushed it, put it in a small piece of cotton, and let me suck on the juice. My colleague became something of the past. I read about an incident that happened in the X River Valley, close to Worcester, where the Reverend Andrew Murray was busy with revival services in, nine, in 1863, when a young Koi girl asked if she could pray. In his book, he reveals how, while she was praying, a rumbling from afar was heard. It became closer and louder. People started speaking in tongues and fell to the floor. Today, nobody knows what her name was, what happened to her, and who her descendants are, if any. The separation of the people from their land also separated them from their indigenous knowledge because their knowledge is stored in the land and the landscape. Not only did they lose their knowledge, but experienced huge trauma which manifested in different social ills. Awareness of indigenous knowledge systems, restoring it where possible to its former glory could help to heal communities so violently stripped of their identity, culture, spirituality, including their education and health systems. In today's modern world, and when I speak of a modern world, I speak of a westernized world, a reintroduction of indigenous knowledge systems has become a necessary intervention. It will be the only way in which we will save the earth and its people. that was so moving, but also so full of just the, the personal aspect of what we're, we're talking about. And I, it would be remiss of me because uh, Ms. Ferris is a poet. Um, we had a chat and I'd really like her to share a poem before we open it up to discussion. Thank you. Um, I really struggled with my spirituality, with my Christianity and uh, my indigenous spirituality. And um, I knew that to find myself, I somehow would have to, have, uh, had to get to a point where I accepted that, you know, I was brought up as a Christian, but that my ancestors were Koi. And um, I saw my aunt, my mother's sister's face in front of me for about two weeks, some years ago. Two weeks, constantly a face in front of me. And I said to my sister, I can believe that my mother has died, but my auntie is with me all the time. And a few weeks after that, my cousin, my auntie's daughter, came to visit early morning in June. And when I got to her later in, she started crying. She said to me that her son is losing his mind. He was 26 at the time. And uh, we discussed it. We didn't want to go to the doctor. And the husband thought that they must go to the police to get him to the doctor. And we discussed it, and we worked out some stuff. We prayed around it, and um, yeah, he became okay. He's on medication. And then I wrote a poem. It was that face that was with me. It was definitely would, would have been described as not Christian. And then to come to terms with it, I wrote a poem. It hasn't got a title yet. It started with, the morning you came with winter's dark, wrapped around your heart. A light went up. Your mother's eyes, which stayed with me for days, were swallowed up by yours. Your hands were cold, and mine were warm. I knew where you were coming from. Two well-taught Christians, I thought, learned to love, to sing, to pray. But her eyes, which stayed with me for days, brought back to me God, the Son, 
and Africa. I knew then where I was coming from. So I get the sense of the tension in, in what you're both describing. I mean, the personal aspect of the, the tension that you've just described, and I think from you, Prof, the tension of um, knowledge and who gets to own knowledge and who gets to decide what is knowledge. And before we open it up, maybe my question is around, I guess, figuring out this tension, right? Um, and in a way, yeah, I like the idea of, do, do we want to start with a colonial encounter, though? Because we were having this conversation outside, and maybe you could speak to some of what you, you were chatting about, Ms. Ferris, about even the very languages that we see as the colonial languages. We think of them in, in, in the colonial moments, so English and Afrikaans particularly, they come within uh, the, the colonial moment. But what was happening before? And how do we go back, in a sense, and keep going back as far as we can to be able to inform this tension that we have about um, indigenous, indigenous knowledge? And perhaps for me, it's always been a question of, um, and, and, and it's a joke my friends and I have, I mean, what is indigenous knowledge in Isis or in Iskot? Which just brings up another tension for me about who decided, and I think Prof, you, you alluded to some of that, who decided what um, what this indigenous knowledge is. So if you could maybe just speak to some of those tension, I'd really like you to speak to the language aspects of it. We are making it even more difficult you now. <laughs> Um, you are speaking to somebody who actually works with the theory a lot. Um, it's a challenge. The, I started with the colonial encounters, but maybe I could have said human encounters. Uh, maybe that, that could have actually enabled us to go back. But it depends about what type of human encounters have we implications for language, implications for cultures, implications for, for knowledges. Some encounters don't necessarily erase what they find. Mm. Uh, one of the, the, the knowledges which I've been reading about uh, of late is the Ethiopian case. And I became interested in the Ethiopian case because we always say Ethiopia was never colonized. Mm -hmm. And I discovered that for the Ethiopians, knowledge was more of wisdom. And the, for Ethiopians, the idea was that wisdom lay all over the world. And it was the duty of Ethiopians to get wisdom wherever it exists. And that, that type of conception of knowledge is the one which then anchors the, the, the story of Queen Sheba going as far as Israel, because he heard that King Solomon was a wise man or something like that. But what is important about the Ethiopian case study is that it then tells us that they were actually going to look for wisdom wherever it existed, bringing it back to Ethiopia. Not to then replace what they had, but to integrate with what they had. But when it comes then to colonial encounters, it's a different case altogether. And it even affected Ethiopia itself in the sense that at the beginning of the 20th century, then they began to send people to America, to the United Kingdom. And then those ones, when they came back, it was no longer the same formula of saying, I get wisdom, I come, I integrate it within what I have. They then came and they said, what was pre-existing was nonsense. What was only usable was what came from Europe. And that, that, that became the problem of, you survive physical empire, but you can't survive the metaphysical empire, which actually invades the mental universe. Yeah. And I think that way then you begin to see cultures then being replaced by other cultures. You begin to see knowledges being replaced by other knowledges. You begin to, I don't want to talk about this other word, which is also controversial, epistemicide, the killing of existing knowledge. But there is always a debate, is it possible that you can heal a knowledge, or you can kill a people, but can you kill a knowledge? Yeah. And I think it's possible you can do both genocide and epistemicide simultaneously. Sure. Sure. And, and we we'll just bring in uh, this at this point. Yeah. Um, talking about language, uh, Prof talked about the women in culture. Uh, I'm a mother tongue Afrikaans, and um, 
you know, uh, research that's being done now uh, shows that Afrikaans actually um, started long before mm. uh, Jan van Riebeek came here in 1652 because the koi were trading with, you know, people coming around the coast from different countries. And they had to be able to communicate with those people. And in that communication, a language already, you know, came about. So the, the koi came, um, the Dutch came with, with, um, with, with their language and started in, uh, um, importing slaves from different countries. Um, uh, you know, even, you know, the, the language was further enriched. And uh, the people at that time called themselves Afrikaners until the British took over the Cape. And um, there was a, a group of people from uh, France, from Germany, and the Netherlands who already called themselves the Boers. And they felt that they're not going to speak English as an official language. And then they took that language that existed and they said, uh, this is our language. Uh, we call it Afrikaans and we call ourselves Afrikaners. There were people who called the language Afrikaans already and they refer to themselves as Afrikaanders. And, um, and talking about, um, you know, developing the language was only, uh, you know, by bringing more Dutch words and even English words made into Afrikaans and leaving out the Khoi influence and the slave influence. So what was that human encounter? Mm -hmm. yeah. And the loss once again. And the again. loss, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think we should open it up. Um, I don't want to hog this wonderful conversation, so we will take three at a time, and there'll be a roving mic. Uh, maybe introduce yourself if you'd like to, um, and then keep it brief. Um, as my mother would say, um, I like you all, yes, don't eat all the words. <laughs> so um, there's enough space for all of us if we're just mindful of the, the time that we have together. So any questions? Okay, great, good. I see one over there. Two at the back, Tess, and three. In the middle here, there are, okay. we'll take those three first. Um, hi, my name is Marco Muzenda from Zimbabwe, currently studying at the university currently known as Rhodes. And my question is directed specifically towards um, Professor Ndlovu Kacheni. Um, in my academic program this year, a lot of the conversations we've been having have been about um, decolonization and deconstructing this idea of modernity as a Western construct. And what I would like to ask you is, is it possible to completely have an authentic decolonial project that is still um, existing in a very colonial structure? So universities currently as we have them in South Africa are very colonial structures and um, from an administrative point of view, from an academic point of view, so is it possible in universities to prioritize indigenous knowledges and you know, pr start that process when you're still existing in very colonial structures? Nice, thanks. Second one is Tess, and then the third one is in the middle here. Thanks, hi, my name's Tessa. I too used to study at UCAR. Um, but I now teach in Eswatini. Um, yeah, um, my question is really more about, could we, I, I would love it if we could elaborate a little bit more about the definition of indigenous knowledge. Mm -hmm. So I teach a subject called theory of knowledge and in that it's listed as an area of knowledge and yet immediately it has to be challenged. And so teaching anthropology as well, I was, I was wondering if we could speak a little bit more about how it's defined because earlier, it was said knowledge, it's knowledge that is con contained, but as an anthropologist, knowledge is never completely contained because cultures are forever interacting. So I'd love it if we could speak more about that. Okay, hi, uh, I'm Arthur Mzofa. I'm from Zimbabwe. Now I'm studying at Stellenbosch University. Um, my question, which comes from a very uh, personal position, is I find myself a sort of cultural gestalt. There's a lot going on. I feel very hybrid most of the time. But I, I am fascinated by the idea of excavating that which has been put beneath in terms of 
cultural hierarchies, you know, which is our indigenous knowledge. But how does one uh, reconcile the need to access this great source of information and ways of being with that just out or hybrid nature or way of seeing things? That, that's my question. Oh, it becomes difficult again. <laughs> One of the the easiest escape routes in a, in a conversation like this is not to answer questions. <laughs> it's just to respond to the questions, and I will try to just do exactly that: to respond <laughs> to the questions. Starting with the question on, I think the the last one and the first one are almost related. Uh, the question of the university, the current university. Universities have been claiming to be islands of knowledge in a sea of ignorance. And because of that, the universities in Africa, not the African universities, because I haven't seen one. <laughs> I've seen universities which claim to be African, mm. and the very fact that they claim to be African, it means they are not. Mm. The problem there is not about the buildings, is not about the land where they are located, it's fundamentally about professors who are within the university. It's fundamentally about me and all the other professors who are in this room. The problem being that if you are a product of that university which you want to transform or to decolonize or to indigenize, whatever the word you might use, I think the starting point is really to start with yourself. A person like myself, I've gone from elementary school up to the university. I have fulfilled all the requirements and the, the rituals of coloniality. <laughs> to the extent that they gave me a PhD and they also inaugurated me as a professor. <laughs> <laughs> and if we have traveled that journey, it is a journey of corruption. Mm. And it is that journey which actually situates you in a particular way within what we call modernity. And when you are thinking about decolonizing the university, Let's move away from thinking that is really about where they are located, about their buildings, about all this. It's specifically about the people who are actually existing within those buildings, particularly their consciousness, particularly their ways of knowing, particularly the people who are actually exiled from themselves, exiled from themselves in terms of language, exiled from them terms in terms of culture exiled in terms, of, in terms of sitting next to themselves rather than being themselves. And these are the people whom we are trying to change. And the question, as you put it, and that's why I'm saying is difficult, when the, the roads must fall and the fees must fall, a movement took place. One of the issues is people who were comfortable within the universities who are not even thinking about changing them, are the same people who are today claiming to be transforming them. And that becomes very problematic because that one is a form of hijacking a, a, what was taking place. And they're actually hijacked by people who might actually, in their hearts of hearts, are not actually converted that there is need for change. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult journey which we need to travel, and we need to be genuine to it in terms of, am I the solution or am I the problem? Mm -hmm. So that would be, my, that would be my, my response to the question, uh, which might actually provoke even more questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then, running away from coming up with a precise definition of what is indigenous knowledge, I've been working with the, within the context of what we call 
uh, what we call decoloniality. And in decoloniality, the escape route which we have taken, which might not be actually adequate, is to think about the locus of enunciation. Where do you see the world from? Where do you speak from? And when we are saying speaking from, we are not speaking only geographically, we are also speaking particularly the epistemic position. And that way then you begin to say, even what we call indigenous knowledge, I don't think is aesthetic. And it links exactly with the first argument which I presented, that even the people who claim to be indigenous today are modern people. Mm -hmm. And they as modern people, as some of the decolonial thinkers will say, we breathe modernity itself. So I think perhaps the most scientific way is just to say, can I think from where I am and see the world from where I am? And perhaps that way the recovery process might take place. That would be my, my, my modest response. Mr. Erso, would you like to add to that? Um, I would I would agree with Prof. Uh, you know um, when you talk about decolonization, it must actually start with yourself, um, and especially I think in um, uh, at university, and uh, because you need to in, you need to engage with, with students, um, will, will will challenge you, you know, and so uh, you need to ask yourself: Am I changing, or am I just pushing on? The other um, question I wanted to answer is how do we get the, the sources of information? Is that as a as a cultural activist, I believe that we should um, we should uh, uh, go on and you know uh, get stories from our communities. Stop uh, marginalizing our community. What they have to tell us is important. It's yeah. I think that's a, a great caveat and we're going to take another set of questions and I'm just thinking about the distinction between universities in, in Africa and African universities and in fact if African universities don't exist they possibly exist in our communities because there's more knowledge there um, and it's making me think about the dreams that you, you kind of alluded to at the beginning do we see knowledge as metaphysical so what does it mean when you get dreams because we know it means something, and how, what does it mean in relation to the rest of our lives? Um, I was just chatting to a friend recently, and she was talking about an interview that she saw with Natalie Portman, and so Natalie Portman is talking about doing her psychology degree at Harvard, and she's being all eloquent, and the interviewer asks her, so what, um, what role do dreams play in your work? And she's like, dreams, dreams don't mean anything. And she said for her, that was like the penny dropping, like you can have a degree at Harvard, but still not understand the power of the different ways in which knowledges occupy our bodies and how dreams occupy our world and what does that mean? Because you feel it in your body and so you know it's there, but what does it mean in relation to what we think of as knowledge outside of ourselves? But Andrew's a white I'm going to take another round. I see a hand right at the back there, another hand over here, and another hand over there. Oh, okay. We'll probably have two more rounds when things can get in. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Tabo Shigange, uh, also from the university currently known as Pretoria. Um, my, my question is directed to Prof. Kumplovokanje in particular. Um, on this, on, someone raised, my colleague Marco raised the issue of the university. And I like how, in fact, you wrote about it in that book where, with uh, Prof. Zondi on decolonizing the African university. But my question then becomes, because I, I don't, I, there's no universal definition, I would argue, for decolonization. And I think therein um, lies a fundamental problem with the decolonization project in South Africa. Because then who is in charge of steering decolonization in our, in our universities when we have reactionary vice chancellors, reactionary senates, councils, etc. Particularly in your historically white universities. And because of that, we end up in a situation where, and they're very quick uh, in their, um, what do you call these things, mission, vision, vision wanting to be the leading African, you know, mm -hmm. like it becomes very technical, technical solutions, you know, technical interventions here and there, cosmetic 
uh, transformation, so to speak. So then I, I then appeal to, you know, you, you, you've had the likes of your Prof. Janssen, for instance. Um, you are told to wrap up, wow. Uh, <laughs> I should not have looked. Okay, but then my question, long and short of my question is, who is in charge of, 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 of austere and decolonization in our universities? Because if we leave it to uh, the logic of, of, of our oppressors who are currently sitting in our councils, in our centers, etc., we're not going to go far uh, besides just replacing white lecturers with black lecturers, who themselves, some black lecturers, are also reactionary. So how do we deal with that element? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm Kimutai, studying at UCT. Uh, my question actually is, uh, and any of the panelists can answer. Uh, in Kenya, we've been talking of the same question, the same issue of uh, rather traditional knowledge and indigenous knowledge. So my question directly uh, is to do with how do we then preserve uh, the existing indigenous knowledge or the indigenous or traditional knowledge which has been discovered and make use of it, uh, bearing in mind the, the question of uh, modernity and evolution of knowledge. So how do we preserve, make use of it, uh, bearing in mind the modernity, stability, or the westernized modernity in that case? Thank you. Great. There was a third hand. There's either Renee and there's another hand here. Yeah, Dorothy, you'll have to choose. I'll start here. <laughs> it's close. <laughs> Hi, my name is Renee. I'm unfortunately not at the university at the moment. Um, but my question is, uh, we've seen kind of the role of universities change quite a bit over the past couple of decades, or maybe um, centuries, I don't know, from being kind of a place where you were grappling with ideas to becoming a place where you get equipped with the skills so that you can find a job. Um, and I'm interested to hear from the panelists whether you think like that uh, quite powerful thrust uh, is in contradiction with the conversations we're having around decolonization, whether it kind of crowds out the space to have more conversations around ideas and around what we're busy with at the university to just like, you know, churning out graduates who can find a job. And on the other hand, is it maybe in the context of a country like South Africa with huge unemployment, is it idealistic to say, well, you know, a university isn't just about getting a job, it's also about ideas and grappling with these, these things? I would like to um, reply to the last question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, what's been happening for the past, I think, 20 years is what I would call the corporatization mm -hmm. of universities, where universities are mainly seen as you know, providing, you know, um, you know, the business world out there with, uh, with, with skill, with worker skill, and um, that, I think, is in direct conflict with what, uh, with what um, a decolonization, you know, project would be at a university. Because um, from experience, I can tell you, it's, um, modules, you know, subjects geared towards making the student ready for the world of work. So yeah, there's that, that's, that's a tension there, that's a question. Uh, <clears throat> today you go to, to universities, particularly those who who do the supervision of postgraduate and the graduate students. The first day you meet, they ask you, I want to finish by November. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and when that question comes, the person doesn't have a topic, doesn't have anything, but already has a time when to finish. <laughs> <laughs> and when you ask, why do you want to finish around that time? Then again, it's all about the labor market. Maybe there's a job somewhere for me. And then you then find this other culture, which I think is already alluded to, the neoliberal uh, corporate university, mm. whereby you love the diplomas, the certificates, but you don't love knowledge itself. Mm. 
and that sure. that is what 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 we face and the, that is the the problem of the invasion of the universities by by what I would call coloniality of markets and what perhaps Mahmoud Mamdan was talking about when he talked about the university becoming a marketplace and the I think this idea of decolonizing is not only about colonialism, it is also about the neoliberal, the impact of neoliberalism mm. on, 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 on institutions of higher learning. So I'm not sure whether the, 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 the movement becomes decorporatization instead of de, de, decolonization or they work, they work together, I'm not, I'm not sure, but that is the, the, the situation which we are facing. Then in terms of who is driving decolonization within the university? There are no new people who joined the university after the roads must fall and the fees must fall. Who are actually using the same people who were within the universities to try and drive that. But as I said earlier on, as long as the professors, the intellectuals, the academics within the university are themselves a product of that university, that's the quandary which we are facing as we try to unroll this issue called decolonization. And bearing in mind, unless we change the, the mode of operation of universities, they operate through committees of Senate, committees of council, and the, the issue being that what then emerges, we don't want to destroy the contestation of ideas in the first place because it becomes actually the hallmark of the university. But you can't also then run a university like the way you run a political party or a church, where in a church you can just invoke the fear of Gehenna, the fear of, of fire, <laughs> and then everyone follows you. <laughs> or in a political party where you can just say, please tow the ideological line. It's not as easy as that in a university. And I'm speaking here as somebody who is actually situated within a university. There are some things which I want to preserve, there are some things which I want to change. But the contestation of ideas, I want it to actually work, to be the mode of the operation of the university. But at the same time, under that cover of contestation of ideas, resistance might actually be covered under that, the resistance to change. So it's, it's, it's really a challenge, and I'm trying to be as practical as possible here, rather than as ideological as I can be. <laughs> Great, thanks, Prof. I don't know if we have time for one more question. Just one, not one round. Okay, there was a burning question. There's already a mic. Awesome. Thank well, you so please. much. Just, uh, thank you so much. I'm Chris. I'm from UCT, and I have just a couple of questions. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. One, one question, Scholar. <laughs> Choose your favorite so, one. The gap between heterogeneity and indigeneity of knowledge, what, uh, what is, is that a function of the resilience of, in, of indigenous knowledges or the aggressiveness of the foreign, of foreign intervention? If I could ask the second question, because there seems to be an argument that knowledge is metaphysical, and does really space matter, does the infrastructure matter, if that argument has merit? Mm. Thank you. <laughs> In fact, the the issue of um, of, of indigenous knowledge, you see, there is there is a way things were not arranged properly, whereby the university sometimes claimed to be the center of knowledge. But I think knowledge is, does not lie within a university. Knowledge actually lies somewhere else. And in the so-called indigenous knowledge, I, I'm not sure whether the, that's the right word. I think Pauline Untoji would prefer the word endogenous. Mm. One which is anchored historically, one which is anchored culturally, one which actually emerges from where the people are. And that one, I think, the way you are using resilient, it has been resilient because there were actually forces which were meant to actually push it out of, of, of the communities. 
and the, I can actually give a very practical example. When I was reading about the establishment of uh, missionary schools, particularly in Uganda, one of the things which came out clearly, particularly boarding schools, what was the logic of boarding schools? The logic of boarding schools was that during the day we teach young people another knowledge. During the night, the parents repeat another one. And what they then decided to do is just to take the children away from the parents, close them somewhere else, so that when they come back home, they are now speaking another language, they are living in another space. And then that way you begin to then de-socialize them rather than socialize them. That's a powerful note to end on, I think. I'm not even going to try and summarize this because I think the conversation is ongoing. Um, and so if there are any other burning questions, try to pin Prof down and try to pin Ms. Ferris down for any more conversation. But I think it's been such a fruitful and um, I said earlier, you know, even in the conversation I had with them just before, just before the session, it's just been mind-blowing and how we can constantly stretch the idea and it's just a matter of giving ourselves time to, to get into these topics. So I'm going to hand over to the next panel. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.